Speaks, which we started when my son was diagnosed at two years old, and we did the first Voices of Latin Rock, which they asked me to produce for the book release. It was supposed to be one show, and we did the one show, and we were pretty happy with it. The book got out. I got the word out on autism. Uh, my son was two years old, and people were coming up to me, when's the next one, when's the next one? So I went to my partners, and I said, people want us to do this again. So we did a second one, and same response. When's the next one? So we did 10, okay? And, and of course, uh, with the help of our sponsors, we were able to pull it off. The fifth year, we did uh, at the Warfield, and uh, that was a sold-out show. And Carlos Santana has been to five of those benefit shows. So we did 10. We did 10 of those. And people are, st I thought I was done at 10. I thought that was a good number. Um, so this is kind of a lead in to maybe one more next year. So just giving you uh, a heads up. Where's Jake? Is Jake? Yeah. Is he ready to roll? So, uh, like I said, we do have a donation box out there. If you like what we're doing, please throw us a, a uh, I want to introduce this man who I met recently. He does a lot of interviews that you can read on Facebook. You can also go to his website and uh, check him out. They're very thorough, the musicians that he speaks to. Uh, he's done interviews with both of these gentlemen before, so he knows them well. And uh, I, I like his style as far as the interviews. And uh, he has a uh, uh, radio talk show, The Jake Feinberg Show. You can uh, go to his website, join, and read some of his uh, interviews. And here he is out of Tucson. Ladies and gentlemen, our moderator, Jake Feinberg. Hello, everybody. Before I begin, um, I just would like to take a moment for everybody to uh, come to complete stillness and pray for all the people that will be affected tomorrow with the, the raids and all the people that are being affected at the border and we just want to, so in, at, I just, I actually, I, I just would like everybody to come to complete stillness and have a total moment of silence for them right now. Thank you so much to everybody. You know, um, these two gentlemen on the stage tonight are leaders. And I'm not sure if people really know what leadership is in our country anymore but they give their heart to everything they do. They've overcome adversity. They've reached the highest of highs and the lowest of lows that only anybody here can, I mean, we can all relate to it in their own way, but the seismic extremes of the highs and lows of, of being a musician is unquantifiable. And through it all, their hearts remain open. They still love. They overcome adversity and they still love. And you know how they did it? Through rhythm. Here's the point. We need a revolution of consciousness in this country 
and I don't have all the answers, but the catalyst to the last revolution of consciousness in this country came from rhythm, and it came from the rhythm of immigrants. It came from the rhythms of di 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 diaspora, from the slave ships, to the Mission District, which is how Carlos Santana started. Okay? Immigration. Rhythms led to a revolution of consciousness. I don't know what the next catalyst is going to be. But I just want to let you know that these two gentlemen tonight represent how we can move forward. They represent the best of America, and they represent love through rhythm. I don't know if they're here. Michael Shreve, Gregorico, welcome. Michael, I just, um, hello. Michael Shreve. Hi, San Francisco. I'm down. You know, um, Carlos Santana called you and said, hey, why don't we do something for the 50th anniversary of Woodstock? And, um, you know, in this day and age, uh, you could go back and be treated like royalty, and you could relive, which is what we do now. We, 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 we comp stuff. We don't do original stuff. So you could relive that solo again. And, um, and you said, no, nah, I don't want to do it. And I just want you to talk to the people about why. Yeah, it's a... It's a Interesting and valid question. And I have so many friends that say, why the hell would you not go back and play Woodstock 50th anniversary? And um, I don't take it lightly. I really don't take it lightly because I know how much it has meant to so many people. Um, but I think some things are best left alone. You can't go back to the garden. I'm sorry. It ain't going to happen. And they've already done like four Woodstocks. And they were kind of disastrous, to tell you the truth. I even played at one that nobody knows about. <laughs> nobody knows because I never told anybody and I didn't let... And I played with an Italian singer named Zucchero, who I was touring with. And um, his manager got a on the bill at, I don't know which Woodstock. It was the one with Nine Inch Nails. It was the one where there were fires and oh, uh. riots and, and, um, <laughs> and I saw some of my contemporaries there who were at the first one. Everybody was taking every opportunity to like be on CNN or, you know, so what's it like to be back, you know? And it's all bullshit, you know? <laughs> And the thing about the 50th anniversary is that it's, it's got weight. It's the 50th anniversary. So I understand that. What's that? Oh, OK. Um, but it's kind of interesting. I, was, I had just turned 20 years old like a month earlier. But I've had to c convince people that I was not 16 for that. I mean, they get arguments with me that, no, you were 16. <laughs> and also, although Woodstock has had a monumental effect on my life and my career, um, it's also been a bit of a burden, which sounds like a spoiled white kid. But I've done a lot of things since Woodstock. 
I've done eight solo albums, played on all kinds of stuff. But all everybody says is, man, I loved you at Woodstock. <laughs> it took me until age 35 to finally accept that fact. Where I was living in New York City and people would come up and say, wow, are you Michael? You're getting older. And I'd go, wow, the amazing thing is, so are you. <laughs> you motherfucker. <laughs> so, but there came a point in time when I got tired of myself trying to tell everybody about, have you heard the latest record I've done? Have you done, you know, is there any way I can convince you to go right instead of like hang back there in memory lane? And I finally just came to a personal decision that I said, shut up, say thank you, be grateful that you did something that meant so much to so many people. Do the music you want to do for the rest of your life, but shut up about Woodstock. So in relationship to the new one, Carlos call, called me or texted me and, you know, it's kind of like, uh, you want to do it again? And, uh, and I don't. I just don't. I mean, I, it's not something I'm proud of. It's just, like, I don't want to go through that. I don't want to, you know, it, it was a moment in time. It was magic, and it looked great on film. To me, it's not one of my great solos or anything like that, but... You can't argue with the footage, and the band was on fire, and, and, and I know I look like I was 13, and all that stuff. That's the other thing that I, I, I had to live with, is like so many people saying, how the hell did you hook up with these guys? You know, you're from Redwood City, for God's sake. Yo, Redwood City. <laughs> No, no, but, but anyway, so in answer to the question, I just think some things are best, best left alone. It's very personal as well, so it's not, I'm not saying it for everybody else, but I look forward. I don't look backward. Gregorico, um, you grew up with um, Michael Carabello. Grow up with him, but I met him uh, the late teens. You didn't, because you did not have a drum kit in your house until you were fourteen. That's right. Your folks, your dad was a first generation immigrant from yeah, Italy. Yeah, he came over from Italy when uh, he was fifteen. I know that you had a trap set somewhere else <laughs> in the Mission District. I, 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 all I'm saying is, where did you start? Did, were you drum? Because when we did our first interview. Um, you talked about uh, going to be with Carabello and he'd have these records from Cuba, you know, Cuba, the, and you put yeah. them on, all right, and you'd listen to them. But I know that you were playing to them. Well, that was so, later. So explain where your first trap set was before you got the one when you were 14. It just in my mind. In I, your I, mind. I, yeah, I, I really, I loved the drums from a kid. From a, I, I used to go on the weekends, I'd, I had this catalog, was it Sherman and Clay? I forget the name. And, and so I'd go to the drum section and had all the pictures of the drums and I'd show my brother. I don't know, he's here tonight, I think, somewhere. Yeah. Mario, where are you? Yeah. Here he is. And, uh, you know, I got to get a drum set, man. <laughs> but my folks, they didn't want all the noise around the house. So I didn't. So finally, when I was 14, I had a job for about six months before I saved a little bit of money. And um, I got a kit. So I started playing. Now, to put that in perspective, and what the, the time and place we were at that time, when we started Sly and the Family Stone, was three years later. I was, I was 17 and a half, had a half a year left to finish high school, and we started the group. So that's how fast things moved in, and I was just in the right place, I guess, at the right time. I had the passion for it, I loved doing it. I was playing, and so I started, when I, you know, I had practiced, I was self-taught. 
So I didn't go and take lessons and get the book and do my rudiments and all that. And I used to drive my other drummer friends crazy. They said they'd come home from school and they'd hit the pad for two hours and do all the rudiments. And I was home in the room downstairs in my house playing to Ray Charles records, uh, Wilson Pickett, little James Brown, some Buddy Rich, some Joe Morello, take five, and that's what I did. So, and then by the time I was 15, I was playing in beer joints with older guys. Yeah, I don't know, I don't know how I hooked that up, but that's what happened. And then at uh, 16, you I met. You learned how to play the shuffle in those beer joints, though, uh, right? It, it, they had to sneak me in. What well, was loose back there? And, you know, it wasn't like it is today. So uh, I met uh, a fellow named Leon Pitillo, who had a group called The Sensations at that time. Later on, became played with uh, Santana for about 10 years as one, the lead singer, I think, during the 80s or something like that. Anyway, back then he had a group, and, and he'd call me every time his drummer was sick. So I would, um, one night I was going out, it was a Friday night, I remember I was going out with the guys, you know, and I had my hand on the door, phone rang, and it was Leon, and says, Greg, you gotta, you gotta save me tonight, my drummer's sick, man. Where are you playing? He said, the, uh, Mission YMCA, on, down on, right? Yeah. Right, right down. I, this is just uh, honest to God. So I said, okay. I threw the drums in the car, went down there. That night he had a fellow sitting in by the name of F Freddie Stewart, who happened to be Sly Stone's brother, who had a very popular radio show, uh, KSOL at that time. Yeah. Right? The f Soul of the Bay. And then he went to KDIA. He was a brilliant disc jockey. And producer, he had produced a record for Bobby Freeman called The Swim, which was a national hit. So I met Freddie. <clears throat> this happened again, cut it a little short, it happened again about two weeks later. And same thing, Freddie was there again. We started talking. He goes, I want to start a group. You want to do something with me? I said, yeah. And so we started a group called Freddie and the Stone Cells. And um, we played, I'll, I'll just, talk about things that are relative here. We played at Mission High School for one of the, uh, you know, the things in the afternoon where they call it Mission High School. And uh, Carlos, young Carlos Santana was there. I didn't know him yet. Uh, later on that year, a fellow by the name of Danny Harrell was his best friend. He was a drummer <laughs> and he was my friend and he said, I gotta introduce you to someone. And uh, this was Carlos. And we, we played at a, a pizza joint on Mission Street, I forget the name of it. Pinky's Pizza. Haggerty used to play See, there in Garcia. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it, anyway, so then, you know, shortly thereafter, well, we went, so we went from the Freddie and the Stone Souls, and Sly had made it a couple attempts of, of, of putting groups together. It was called the Stoners, I think. And uh, it didn't work two or three times. And then he had finally went around and handpicked different people around the bay. And one night I show up for a rehearsal for Freddie and I at the house, and nobody was there uh, from the group. And Sly and Freddie were sitting there in the kitchen. I said, where's, you know, where's the rest of the guys? They go, we're going to start a new group tonight. Want to do it? You know, they didn't tell me what was happening. So uh, you want to do it? I said, well, I'm here. You know, we're just kind of, we're, we're, it was very casual, right? And they, and they were kind of messing with me. So that night we all met. Uh, Freddie, Larry, Graham, Cynthia Robinson, Jerry Martini, Sly, myself. And we started, we talked, but we didn't play. We actually talked about what we were gonna do. And this was kind of an unusual thing too, because no one had really put together in a popular group, male, female, black and white. This is in 1966 when there was a lot of turmoil in the country racially. There was riots and stuff like that. So this was, but you know, being in San Francisco, it didn't, it, it, we were cool with that. It, 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 didn't, it was not a threat. As a matter of fact, it was kind of, it felt exciting, you know, to go and play music and have all this mix of, uh, of people. 
So that's where it all started, and I'm sorry, because I probably forgot what no, you I, originally I, asked th me. Th <laughs> First of all, No, nah, first of all, I, I mean, it, the entire co conversation is stream of consciousness, but I, uh, do you believe, I don't know what the catalyst for the next revolution of consciousness is going to be, but how res do you believe in my thesis that, in fact, the rhythms that you and Graham were cranking, that Carabello and Shreve and... Chapito, the, the, the indigenous rhythms of the immigrants led to the revolution of consciousness, especially at Woodstock. Also, the idea that you brought the drums to the forefront of the music. That was, they were an accompanist instrument. Obviously, Buddy Rich took it to a yeah. new level. But I want you to focus on the idea of rhythm as a revolution of consciousness and if that was the factor in Woodstock. Well, so, so let me say, first of all, I believe that rhythm is one of the, if not the, first means of human communication. Back before language, when there were just tribes in the hills and stuff like that, and this is worldwide phenomena, the means of communication for long distance anyway was, or the only way was to hit something. It was drums, logs, they were playing sounds on, percussive sounds on logs, and that was the first, I think, means of communication. So rhythm is a very powerful thing. In music, it is the foundation in which you build the house. So uh, that's the thing that, d that drives music, is rhythm. So, yeah, uh, I don't know what that might be. And what well, because the East, Coast it, band, the East Coast bands at Woodstock it, the bands, the iconic bands that made their names were Santana, Sly, the West Coast bands, the ones that well, drove ethnic. You can re, you can jump in anytime you want on this. All we did was we 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 were there was a lot of experimenting going on. We happened to be at a time where people were taking some of this from here and some of this from here. I mean that's what we did. We fused different ideas, different genres together. And yeah, I mean, I, I don't know about the, the revolution, but um, <laughs> I do feel the same way, as Greg, um, and I believe in the power of rhythm, which is used in healing ceremonies in indigenous peoples for centuries. Um, and it's obvious that it brings people together. Um, as far as, like, when you talk about indigenous with Sly and Greg, it seems far-fetched to me. We were listening to R&B, you know? Me too. I was doing James Brown. When a single came out, man, I did everything I could to get that thing under my belt. It took a lot of work. That stuff was, was, you know? And I would try to go down to a club, and like Greg, I don't remember why they would let me in. <laughs> well, number you. one, you're too young, and, and you look like you're 13. But the thing I wanted to do was throw down and show the brothers I could play the latest, the latest James Brown groove. I mean, that, that, that's what it was to me. Well, no, okay, but, but, but it, you, I want you to talk to the audience. Did anybody in the East Coast know what Latin rock was before Santana showed up at Woodstock? Yeah, what, there really, was, there, there, there no, it really was Tito was, Puente. It was Tito Puente. Yeah, but even Tito, when when we got a little bit popular and we had done Oyo Como Va. About talk about the New York gig. That's Latin. Rock, that's that's burning, pulsating rock. That was rock music. That was. I mean, the Palladium was all that the East Coast knew. Yeah. What what do you what do you say? Wasn't it the Palladium or you guys? It was. Uh, was it Tito? Was it Tito Puente? Played with Tito Santana? I, no, I didn't play with Tito. We went to see Tito at the Corso. But didn't you play it? When I, I had a, Carabello told me about a story about, you know, the first time when you guys were on the same show, and they were just like, you had to give it up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean... What was that story? I, <laughs> I don't know. I, I know that we did some... They did not respect us at first. Right. Let's put it that way. So, you, and so they didn't respect it because you were plugged in? Because we were young, 
rock and rollers, and yeah. they thought maybe we were, it's the second time I've asked what this word is, appropriating, um, you know, which is a weird word. I mean, it's like, that's like, I mean, either we're open to cultures or we're not. Either we're open to being influenced by the best of every culture or we're not. And why the hell would we not want to be, you know? So when I got in Santana, I hadn't played any Latin music, you know? Everybody says, man, you know, you play that Latin music. The truth is, <laughs> I don't. I mean, Dick Cress, man. I, Dick Cress. Yeah, big band at San Mateo College that gave me a big break. But I never played Latin music. I played R&B. I didn't even play rock and roll, you know, and jazz. I aspired to be a jazz drummer. So, um, what was the question? <laughs> okay, so what I'm talking about is, before I got in Santana, I never played. And when I did get in the <laughs> band, um, I was, I, I used to study out of one book, a Ted Reed book that was, um, he wrote the syncopation for drummers and there was a Latin thing, had the most basic things and I learned them. But in Santana, I didn't really do that. And as I was really aspiring to be jazz, if you ever listen, well, of course you have, otherwise you wouldn't be here, but <laughs> to the Santana records, when we go, when the band went Latin, I wouldn't play like, like the cowbell. I swung it like a jazz drummer. So everything was like a jazz influence, which made it unusual. The same with Michael Carabello, because he was not authentic whatsoever. Chapito, nothing against him. Um, Chapito was the really authentic Nicaraguan, kind of brilliant, very brilliant, like, Chepe. I mean, he, he was probably the deepest musician in the group in, in a lot of ways. He brought the authenticity. I mean, I saw Santana with my brother Kevin at, at what's it, Mount Carmel Church in San Carlos. And, you know, it was just so raw. I don't even know why we went, but I remember saying, I, I want to play with that band. So, but I did not have any Latin, you know, so in terms of indigenous, you start to go later, you go like, wow, why didn't I take advantage more of Chapito and Armando and stuff like that, you know? I gotta say this one time, I told Greg last night, I, I was a, a Sly fan, but the first time I, I saw him was in Redwood City on El Camino in a place called, what was it called? Winchester Cathedral. And there used to be a guitar player or drummer named Mel Brown that would play there. You oh, remember Mel Brown? God, man, I love that guy. Anyway, I saw s these guys. I was like, oh my God, what is this? Next day was the Monterey Pop Festival. I remember that because it was seeing Greg and Sly, and then the next day I hitchhiked down. I, you know, my memory is, I need to do more crossword puzzles, but... Um. Michael, this is absolutely imperative that you answer this question. In today's, like, there, there was a, a, there's a documentary film crew do, doing great interviews here, um, and they talk about still the thriving festival scene. How did you, explaining the story, you guys did not even have an album out. So how, without having any product out, were you invited to Woodstock? Bill Graham. Now, in lay terms, without getting too deep in the weeds, I mean, he, you know, Greg was, we were, we were talking in the dressing room about the, the salary list. I don't know how much you wound up getting as a band. But how did he get, how did that happen? That would not happen in today's world. Where we no, would, the, no, no band would get invited to a major festival without having any, any material. Right, well, what happened was that Michael Lang and his friends, you know, were, 
deep in, in it, and they realized, we don't really know what we're doing. <laughs> and they needed a grown-up. And Bill had Fillmore West, and he had the Fillmore East. He was a big fan of Santana and a couple other bands, of course, in the Bay Area, but he loved Santana. And they asked him for his help, and they would pay him. He said, I'll do it, but only if one of these two bands can play at the festival. And I forget what the other band was. Michael Lang heard Santana uh, tape, and he said, we'll take them. And that's how we got on. I think we got paid 1500 bucks or something like that. Um, which, you know, you didn't see the money, you know. Uh, so it didn't really matter. But, but the beauty for us at Woodstock, and my, my favorite, Jimmy was incredible, but we stuck around that night to hear these guys. And it was, wow. it was amazing because we knew each other from the Bay Area. And the reason that we connected was, this is the truth, we weren't hippie bands. In Santana, we were not a hippie band. You know, it was the opposite. Although everybody appreciated the scene, we'd rehearse all day, and I don't think they did. We rehearsed like uh, checking into work. I mean, I got paid a salary, and we rehearsed for eight hours every day, and after that, let's go to the Fillmore. We get in for free, and we check out the scene. If the band was something we needed to learn from, we'd stand there, you know, looking at them all together. If they weren't, the hippie chicks were beautiful. It was a, it was a scene, and it was a really great scene because the way Bill put the shows together were fantastic. But uh, talking about Sly, the reason we stuck around because they were our brothers, but whenever we would play double bills in the area, it was like West Side Story. <laughs> I mean, we were throwing down, you know? And, and the hippie bands didn't have competition, and we were competitive. It was a beautiful thing because I think they were probably some of the strongest shows we ever did yeah. whenever we played with these guys. Um, Greg, I think you can clear some stuff up for the audience in our in our second interview. Um, you were you 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 have a way of like saying very few words, but they're very profound. And you talked about um, the misconception around Sly Stone. I, I was watching the Woodstock video the other night, and um, you know he's so out there. You know, I look at all. I don't. I'm not that tuned into like mod music, but. You see all the personality, his personality is so heavy today. And he had that on top of being a great producer and a music, okay. And yet there's this, I mean, part of my show is about overcoming adversity or, you know, dealing with that fall. And like when you talk to me, he won that $5 million settlement, but actually he didn't. It got overturned. And people now, when they're in the room with him, I know you still speak to him on occasion. People that are in the room with him, they um, they want the old Sly, but they but it's not there anymore. And I just wanted you to talk because there's he's a myth he's kind of mythological in his own way. Yeah. But I just wanted you to riff on that any way you wanted to. Well, you know, as far as his personality and you know his capabilities of. You know, what we accomplished as a group, what he accomplished as a songwriter, is uh, the songs speak for themselves. They continue to live on into the future with new generations far removed from when we created that stuff. And um, so that's a testament to his songwriting. His personality was bigger than life, and, and he could carry it. He just, you know, as far as him succumbing to some of the elements that there's a lot of people that aren't even here anymore uh, as a result of that. It's just amazing. But uh, 
he's, uh, I, I always, I have a saying that, you know how a cat has nine lives? Sly has nine cats. <laughs> you know, and it's really true. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of like, to me it's, you know, it's, it's kind of like, it's tragic in a way because here's a person that was so vibrant, gave so much, and uh, some of the stuff that, he, that was accomplished is just still lives on, like I say, into the future and touches people around the world. And to see that, um, yeah, that person that we all remember and just want to be there is not there, but here he is, he's still around. So that's, you know. No, I mean, I think anybody in this room can relate to that on some yeah. level. Um, but w as you go out on your own to carry this music forward, how often do you think about Sly? And, and, and what, 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 what do you, what is, what is the most important thing for you to do as you, as you go on this singular journey to keep the music going? As far as performing the songs that we created, back then uh it's not there's nothing to reinvent or anything it, it's not for me it's not that big of a challenge except for the just to stay physically in the shape to deliver and so it's just about delivering the music in the spirit and in the level in which we created it and so i'm blessed to be able to still be able to do that and i just it keeps me in shape and i still love it When was the first time you met Michael Shreve? Um, had to be I'll, I'll answer that. Uh, yeah, there we go. One of the shows. So um, once I got in Santana, everything changed overnight. I, I mean, I remember yeah. saving up money to have union fees so I could play weddings that make money, <laughs> you know. And then I got in Santana, and they were like, well, are you in the union? We'll take care of that. And uh, where are you living? You know, where you, you know, and here's a salary, and I was like, oh man, this is like something new. And Carabello, uh, Michael Carabello, of course from Santana, and was friends with Greg, and one night he drove me down to his newly purchased house, I thought was Hillsboro, but I, I now realize it was Burlingame. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing funny about that. But it was an amazing house, and it had a picture window, a huge living room, and the drums were set up right in front of the big window, just empty, no couches or anything, and then a, a monster stereo system, and that was it. And I, I thought, how cool is this? Like, I mean, I set my drums up for years in my parents' living room, you know, but I'd take them down every day. And, um, and here's a guy, like he's 19 or something, and he's got this house in the hills, and he's got drums in the living room. Like, it's not in the bedroom, you know. And I thought, no oh, this, this could be good. Yeah. And that's the first night that I met Greg, but he was always very gracious, and of course I was a huge fan, so, you know. It's, it, it's not like you took these people for granted just because you were in the same, you know, same age and same kind of scene. I, I never took somebody like Greg Arrico for, for granted, like, ever, even with later meeting musicians and becoming musicians with friends like Elvin Jones and people like that. Even though we were close, I never took it for granted. To me, they always stand as kind of monumental, you know? It's like, when you're a musician, you're a fan of music and a fan of musicians. So it really never goes away, you know? You don't take that for granted. Greg, um, do you feel like um, the reason that the, the effect of the bands like Santana and Sly and um, well, Michael was from Redwood City, obviously, but uh, you guys grew up in the city, mm -hmm. and even today, you look at a band like Tower of Power, Garibaldi's in California, Jerry Cortez's in Salt Lake City. Um, 
Rocco's in Vegas, what, you know, okay, all this stuff, you know, right. but it's more disparate. And the fact is that you guys, I'm not sure if Michael was commuting from Redwood City or not, but um, you all committed to the city of San Francisco you, like, as bands. How much did that play into um, the, the, the regional sound of San Francisco that went to Woodstock? The fact that you chose to stay here, and I guess more to the point is how hard is it today when we are so separate, more separate now? Uh, well, you know, as far, I mean, I was born and raised in San Francisco, so, uh, you know, that, that was, this was my default. This was my norm, so. But San but Francisco. No, you're, you're, like, like now, like, you're going to a gig and eight people are flying in from eight different states. That's, you guys didn't do that. Well, back then, yeah, uh, no, we didn't do it. You couldn't afford to do it because all this stuff that happened during that time, it's kind of like, you know, it was innocent. It wasn't a business yet. And, uh, and actually, uh, San Francisco was unique also in the way that it was always, San Francisco was always different. We always did our own thing. It was very independent. There's people from all over the world here. And as far as the music business and what was people were listening to on the radios and stuff, it always came from Los Angeles or New York, you know, but the talent was here all the time. It just had never came to be, came together and been developed. So during this 60s was just, you know, more people came in, uh, and I guess just it was the right um, atmosphere in which to where we just got, it, there was places to play. Also, uh, you know, there were places for us to, to, to go, hey, let's, Let's jam a little bit and then go play over here, you know? So that was going on. And that's what brought guys like Bill Graham over here because he was seeing this garden that was growing and no one was doing anything with it. Uh, the traditional record companies that were established at that time didn't understand what was going on in San Francisco and they didn't know how to come and take control of it or do anything with it, it <laughs> you know. So it actually came from all the, uh, the creative people here, the musicians, because we got together and started doing stuff for real passionate reasons. And I think that's what was part of the genuineness of it, of it you know. And the you, you talk about the nest that was built here that culminated in, right. in the explosion of the San Francisco sound. Right. But being a cultural enthusiast, that I, I really want to nail you down because the music didn't happen in a vacuum. So what was the catalyst? I mean, was it, was it, the, was it the beat poets? What led to the music? The music didn't just, just happen. Well, what was there? Because you, re you remember when it was just a city where people would go and visit. Well, look at, all, look at all the different musics that came from here during that period. You had psychedelic music. You, you had, uh, you know, R&B. It was called soul music. What preceded that in order for the music to come? To there, was, there was jazz. You know, there was Joe Morello who had the shop down in the The, Fillmore, Di district. the Fillmore District was all black, right? The Fillmore District. You had jazz, uh, late night clubs, you know, after hours clubs. And... Um, so there was a lot of creativity here, but there was no necessarily any business yet. This was all, and, and San Francisco being an intersection of, of international, you know, there's people from all over the world here. So all this different input, all this diversity, and that was a creative time. Look at the songs that were written and created. Look at all the groups that came out of San Francisco. You got, you know, first, you know, it was our, our folks music. Sinatra and you know Pat Boone, Benny Goodman, and, well, Benny, you know, and then there was all the jazz groups, you know, Basie, and and then Elvis came along and just blew everything up. You know, all the attention went to that, this new rock and roll, and then the Beatles came out. And I blew think that, that out I, I think water. that was a big thing. I think the Beatles just changed everything. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah, and, and even the groups like the L.A. groups or. San Francisco groups, no matter what music they were playing, the Beatles were always still like the pinnacle. Mm -hmm. and, and they made a lot of people pick up instruments as well. Yeah, and do their own thing. Yeah. They, weren't, uh, they broke the fear of, well, you can't do that. Right. You, yeah, you could do it. Write your own music, for instance. Yeah. That was a, a first. Yeah. 
And also the environment here, I think, aside from the jazz stuff, but before the psychedelic era, um, the jazz stuff was before the psychedelic era, but I know from being a kid in, in the suburbs um, and being deeply into music, mostly jazz, but being of a particular age that you could not ignore what was happening in San Francisco with the Grateful Dead and the Jefferson Airplane and Big Brother and Blue Cheer. Anybody remember Blue Cheer? Sons of Champlin. Sons of Champlin. So you couldn't, you couldn't deny it. it. It was just, plus if you're young, it was like cool. It was like, I remember going to see um, Jefferson Airplane and Santana. I don't know if I planned it. It was just, it was a concert across from, in Palo Alto on El Camino called Palo Alto Park or something like that. Before you were in the group? Before I was in the group. And I, um, I think my brother and I used to go to all these things. But I remember, <laughs> I remember thinking, I remember like thinking a couple of things. Like I, I noticed Carlos, I even remember what he was wearing. Like this fishnet shirt and this belt. And he was, he was different then. And he's standing back just watching everything. But not like a usual guy who watches, like he's really checking it out. I remember Jack Cassidy and Yorma and Jack having these shades on and his hair. And I, I thought, how the hell do you get to be that? <laughs> how do you get so cool? You know, like, what is that thing? What's that? I'm sorry, I missed that. <laughs> Go ahead, brother, speak up. No, Jack Cassidy was the bass player for Jefferson Airplane. Different Cassidy, yeah. We're talking psychedelics here. Um, but anyway, it was fascinating to me, like, how these people look like they look, you know? And, you know, I was into music. I wasn't so much, like, into the scene or being a hippie, but it was something. It's just like when you see Sly and these guys. They were, the look had something to do with the attraction. The vibe, a, a the vibe, side, you know? We were vibe. making a statement, no, no doubt. Yeah. <laughs> and, but always it was the music. Um, and I just think that those bands broke a lot of ground for a lot of people. It was political. Um, and then Bill made a place for everybody to come together and play, aside from Winterland as well. And I think it just, and then LSD. I, I, I'm not joking, I just think it had a big influence on, on everything that was going on with those seminal bands. Even if you know, we weren't so in, into that, um, I think it had a big effect. Do you think, that, I mean, because they were tripping while they were playing? They were tripping enough to, to make a life that said, we're going to do what we want. And, and their, their minds, you know, blew open and the boundaries broke down. It, it, it can happen. And, um, and I think that's what happened and created all these possibilities for young kids, which was, of course, a little scary for both the kids and the parents, you know. I, to this day, I, I can't, can't quite put my finger on why my parents let me go to certain places. Yeah, I'm surprised. Well, no, because your dad, but your dad had a deep, deep taste in, in good music, because um, it's all music, it's either good or bad. Yeah. But I think a lot of people in the audience that may have been alive during Woodstock, or like Dr. Dr. Rock, Bernardo Gonzalez, who's sponsoring, who put together this whole thing. Um, thank you for that. Thank you for this. Yeah, thank you. I mean, he was, at 15 years old, when he saw your, I don't want to get too sidetracked, but how long did it take for you to actually see your drum solo? Was it with him after going on the 747 when you hit the, hit the ceiling from the jet blast, or did you see it before? <laughs> Come on.
come again? <laughs> All right. Fill them in. Yeah, so, so I'm trying to mix two things together. Here's the thing. The drum solo for you, for many years, you, people would come up to you. Oh, yeah. You'd say, yo, listen to Automatic Man. Listen to, t listen to me and Bayete. Listen to me and Michael Henderson. They'd say, no, you, you love the Woodstock. You'd say, you know, so it was a blessing and a curse. What I'm saying is it had an impact on people. Yeah. And so my question, the, the, the question is, can you, looking back 50 years from now, you chose, you said, thanks but no thanks to Carlos. Oh. And why, but when you look back on that solo, was there a demarcation point when you said, I'm just going to let it be? You mean about the drum solo? Yes. The actual... The idea of letting people get off on it. Oh, sure. Instead of well, trying to I, push I, others. I got tired of like fighting it. Basically, you know, it's like I surrendered. <laughs> and I, I think that's a valid word, and I think it's appropriate for me to arrive at that place. You know, I mean, it goes in different stages. This drum solo is like, um, also, to me, I can watch it, and it's very exciting because the band is so exciting. I don't think it's such a good solo. <laughs> and, um, but I get it, I get it. I mean, here's this kid playing with these guys and it's, it's, I'm, I'm joyous and it's like, it's unbelievable. But, you know, I've got so many better solos on YouTube. Feel free to point people in, I mean, there's Okay, one, okay, yeah. a year later, Santana at Tanglewood, where we opened for Miles Davis. And of course, by that time, you know, Carlos was into Miles, and I was always into Miles. But for the man to come up, drive up in his yellow Lamborghini by himself, top down, with his, just him and a trumpet case. <laughs> and you're watching and you're going, damn, this is Miles Davis, you know? This is Miles Davis. And so, I look at like this concert at Tanglewood, and um, what do you like about that solo? It's just so much better. It's so mo much more cohesive, and um, and there's another one, '73 in Kyoto, um, that the band. This is the, the second band with Richard Kermode and Tom Coster and Armando and Leon Thomas, and we were kind of peaking. I mean, musically. Um, so, you know, I, I get tired of even, like, I shouldn't say, like, I don't like the solo in Woodstock. What good does that do, you know? <laughs> but it's mine, and I can say that. So, and I can point you in a direction where... It's I, just one of those magic moments. It's one of those moments, and, it, and who yeah. am I to take it away from anybody? Yeah. My jumbled uh, two-part question there related to the fact of instantaneous information, meaning that if you went back... Yeah, Jerry Miller was one of the first rock guitar players with John Cipollina. You're right about that, all right? Yeah, Amen. Jer Jerry Miller is incredible. Badass, that, badass. That, band, that band was one of the most exciting yeah. bands. And that they, get, they get overlooked, but, but yeah. if you went to... If, if Woodstock goes down, uh, Carabello said it is, um, and you well, there's two of them. So there's one at, at that um, Live Nation is doing at um, the original site, Bethel not on the site, but Bethel at the Woods. Yeah. Bethel Woods. Yeah. It's a beautiful museum, and there's a amphitheater. That so one will happen. Carabello is doing it. Greg Raleigh turned it down, and I turned it down. So if you went there, though, in theory, and just had a, a you know. You did great. You had a great solo. Got captured. It would be instantaneous all over the world. Millions of views on Facebook, okay, or wherever. How long did it actually take you to see your drum solo? Was was it when they went for the screening? I'm just trying to put it we, in perspective. We, we went to as what are you saying? We went to a screening. The first screening. We all got on a plane and went down to Los Angeles. It was PSA. And the thing he's talking about at 747 is just before landing, coming into Los Angeles, there was a 747 in front of us. And when we turned for the final approach, we got jet blast and it threw the plane out. And Michael hit the Michael doesn't the remember ceiling. that, dude. We, no, not you, Carabello. Hit the ceiling. <laughs> and, we, you know, it was pretty Friday. We thought we were done. But 
And anyway, yeah, we were on the way to see the screening for the first show in the woods of it, the first edit. You, maybe you don't oh, remember that, it, but That must I remember. have been so traumatic <laughs> that I have blocked it out of my mind. I will begin therapy on Monday. <laughs> I swear to God, it's unbelievable. I was just joking with my family earlier about putting out, um, what do you call it, like a, a notebook where you can take notes or like a, a journal notebook, all blank pages. And on the cover it says, the things I don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember that. I do not remember that. There are, there, it's so odd. Well, you know, they say if you was, you know, yeah, Woodstock and, or if you, did you remembered anything, you weren't there. You weren't there. Because everybody was... Well, so that's part of my role is to help you remember this stuff, well, you know? Well, I, 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 I tell you, like, you know, how many times do we get asked, like, what was it like at Woodstock? And so, <laughs> you know, I came to the conclusion today, because we did an interview earlier, I came to this conclusion all by myself, that anybody that was Woodstock, at Woodstock was in a time warp. It was kind of cosmic. And when you left, you don't remember a thing. And I believe that's true for everybody. And anybody that tells you different is lying. Because that was a big deal. And I don't remember very much. You, Greg? I remember quite a bit of it. You know, I, oh. I, I do. And I was there. There goes my theory. I'll tell you a memory of Woodstock. Um, uh, well, no, uh, that wasn't my memory, but um, <laughs> it was this, that the, the thing was going on, everybody, it was a little crazy, and <laughs> Sly was supposed to go on, at Sly and the Family Stone at 8.30 or something. Yeah. And, but what I remember is, he refused to go on until they paid him in cash. <laughs> Was that why we didn't go on till three? Yeah. I, I remember being there and like getting the buzz about this thing and I thought, damn, that is so cool. <laughs> I mean, this ain't no hippie thing. <laughs> right? I mean, this is like, and that's what I also say about Santana Band and I, I said this in, my speech at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, dropping names, and I said, I soon learned after moving up from the suburbs and moving in with these guys in, um, what's that, um, Bernal Heights, and taking my place on the couch, and I say, I soon learned that this was, in a few rehearsals, this ain't no hippie love thing. This is like a street gang, and the weapon is music. And it was true, it was true with, with Sly and the Family Stone, too. It was like very serious. And so when Sly did that, I mean, that's Chitlin Circus, circuit stuff, you know, it's cash, Chuck Berry, you know. Um, but I was so impressed with that. Actually, you know, that, the, there's truth to that, but I don't remember that particularly happening that night. And but I do. And, and, and it may have. <laughs> but I know that uh, we were supposed to go on at 8 p.m. Saturday night. And uh, Michael Lang kept coming back and saying, uh, everything's behind, guys. I'm so sorry. But give us another hour. This happened about five or six times. We ended up going out at 3 in the morning. And, uh, you know. So now I know how late I was there. <laughs> yeah. It was kind of frightening, too, because, um, you know, all those people had been there already a couple nights and days and exposed to the sun, heat, dust, rain, loud music, day and night, day and night, Saturday night. We were going to go on at prime time, 8 o'clock, boom. That's just like, you couldn't get any better than that. And so it kept getting put back. By the time, three in the morning, you know, after midnight, it started just horrendous downpour. So people went in their tents and their sleeping bags and, you know, they're got, tired. Got flooded. They're done with it, they're tired. So now just think of, you know, 
if you're going to go on, you got your your compadres with you, and you got to go perform. And but the reality is, everybody's unplugged. They're tired. They're beat up. And who cares? And so it was like deeply frightening. And we just kind of at, at the end of the day, I mean, we kind of looked at each other and says, all we could do is go out there, do what we do, and do it hard. And it was just kind of like that simple of a thought. We went out, first couple, so you know, like I said, every day it was raining, had just stopped raining by the time we hit the stage, which was good. And, but still everybody's unplugged, you know. Uh, by about the second or third song, they'd start coming out and kind of getting into it. And third, fourth song, everybody's up dancing and the rest was history. Yeah, it's amazing, amazing. I mean, uh, there was also, um, uh, there were cats holding up the stage. Oh, yeah, I found out about 10 years ago, talking to some guys in production, um, that, uh, you know, the production left a lot to be desired. And it's not like it is now, where the sophisticated lights and sound system and stage and steel rods and holding everything up. This was like plywood. <laughs> You know, probably the, the first grade plywood, real thin. Anyway, uh, I found out that there was about 20 guys underneath the stage holding up because it was going up and down like this, and they were literally holding up. And we were we was pounding that stage. Wow. And uh, Wizard of Oz. Frightening yeah. thought. Yeah, Could have went through if they weren't there. Just uh, want to give a big round of applause to these two beautiful cats, Michael Shreve, Gregorico. Can to open it up to the audience now? Sure. Q&A? Yeah, yeah. yeah, let's do that. Okay, great. All Thank right. you so much, everybody. So, uh, if anybody has some questions, let's see. After the show, Mr. Shreve, I have a question from Chicago, from Che Giannaquino, the son of Albert Giannaquino. Sure. If I could talk to you after the Q&A, real quick. Yeah, uh, maybe. I, I'm in touch with... I'm in touch with Jay. Okay. Personal, huh? Okay. Hey, Mike. Mike, you said you weren't really familiar with Latin music, per se, but uh, Cal Jader, Mungo Santa Maria, Rene Tuzet, a lot of these guys were yeah. already happening, and this is before the rock thing hit. Yeah, okay. And in San Francisco. Cal Jader, yeah. I was a fan of Cal Jader. And I used to... Johnny Ray. Me you too. Went to, you went to drum... The, the, uh, we were talking about this last night. I lived in Redwood City, and I would take an early morning train to Mountain View, where I went to high school. And I'd go early because I was in the band. And um, every once in a while, after my mother left, I would go the opposite way and go up to San Francisco. And... I would go to this drum shop called Drum World. Yeah. And that's what we were talking about, yeah. And Johnny Ray worked there, and Johnny Ray played with Cal Jader. And so, oh, another, so I was aware of it, but I, I wasn't playing Latin music, you know? I really, I really wasn't. If, if any ethnicity was R&B and funk stuff, uh, so. But I have a great story, which one of the trips that I was supposed to be at school and went up to the city, I got there early, the place wasn't open, but there was this nice Italian man with the mustache standing out there. And we went and had breakfast because the store wasn't open. And it turned out to be Remo Bele, the, the creator of the plastic drum head that is, everybody uses now. And he was just getting started, and we had the loveliest meal. And so he's not around anymore. But ever since then, we, you know, we have this history that, so, anyway, I'm sidetracking. But, yeah, I, I, you know, I didn't know Latin music. You also, I, I wasn't uh, even exposed to it, really, you know, except for something like that. You also got thrown out of St. Pius, I think, right? Junior high school? Didn't you say I'm sorry. St. Pius in Redwood City? St. Pius. I went to St. Pius yeah. in Redwood City. Yeah. 
And I went to um, Goodwin School in Redwood City. Oh, yeah. Um, after I got kicked out of St. Pius. Right. And, um, <laughs> and, and then the other school I was talking about was also a Catholic all-boys yeah. school called um, St. Francis. Yeah. Uh, I have a question for Greg. You know, when uh, Sly started coming around again and making some appearances, and, and you guys had the tribute on the Grammys, um, you know, and he came out in that gold LeMay outfit, and everybody was glad to see uh, Sly again, and he came out with the mohawk and the, the whole bit. Uh, and, and when he walked off stage, I was watching the show, I thought that was part of the thing. But can you talk about that appearance? Yeah, he wa when he walked, he, he was actually confused, and he left early. He was supposed to, we were, still, we were doing hire, and he was supposed to go into, you know, call and response, yeah. let me take you hire, you know, right. like we used to do. Yeah. And he got confused, he walked off, and the, uh, how many people were on stage? There must have been 20 people yeah, on right. stage, which they actually should have let the family stone yeah. take it, and probably would that might have gone a little smoother right. but in any event it was kind of frightening because it's live yeah to the world right there's no take two <laughs> this is live and everybody turns around and looks at me like yeah. <laughs> and so I, I you know I'm just playing ahead and I was looking for a spot to get out to do the end tag and end it and we, that's what we did yeah. and no one ever knew they thought that they didn't, no one know. You know they didn't know if that he yeah. was. You we know, thought yeah, it was like part you thought of the it show. was part of the show, yeah. whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. A few more questions. Uh, yeah, Mike Shreve. Hey, uh, who introduced you to Carlos? And uh, that's one question. The second question: What time signature is that you're doing when you played Flame Sky? Uh, what time signature, Flame Sky? Uh, I right. think it's nine. Um, awesome! Awesome! Man, I gotta tell you, like that's Dougie Rouch, and, oh, and Dougie oh. was like, you know, genius. And Carlos was into Mahavishnu, um, but Dougie kind of came up with that because he oh. was into odd times. I I wasn't, and I'm not, and still I, so. I always feel uncomfortable listening to that stuff because I don't feel like it's a natural flow for me uh, on a personal level, but I'm, I'm glad you like it. Oh, that's awesome, man. Thank you. Uh, next question. Who introduced you to Carlos? Who introduced me to Carlos? Great question. Oh, it's a great story, too. How much time do we have? <laughs> no, I'll, I'll, make it, I'll make it brief. Um, I was living in Redwood City. I called my friends, say, Let's go up to Fillmore and see if we could sit in. And um, Michael Bloomfield was playing with Stephen Stills and Al Cooper. And everybody said no. I borrowed my father's car. I went up there. Before I could think twice, you know, I walk in, go straight to the stage, pull on Michael's cuffs. I say, hey, man, I'm a drummer. You think I could sit in? And so I, just, I was just doing it so I could say to myself, at least you tried, and waiting for the kick in the face, you know? But he got it. He said, oh man, the drummer's a really nice guy. Let me go ask him. <laughs> and the next thing I know, I was on the stage playing at the Fillmore, which was Mecca. And again, like post-traumatic stress, I don't remember anything about it. What's wrong with me? But you I don't remember anything about it. So, right. backstage, backstage, I'm there, and, and Stan Markham and David Brown, the manager and the bass player from Santana, were there, and they said, man, we heard you play, and, and we're thinking about getting another drummer. And um, can we get your number? So I, I gave them the, the number. I never heard from them. Saw him again at a, dan a dance thing at Woodside High School in Redwood City. And then later, like a year, I don't know how long, um, I walked into this recording studio that I was always hustling time in called Pacific Recorders in San Mateo and El Camino. Wow. Literally, I'm walking in, it's like late at night. The drummer in Santana, Doc, was 
walking out the door, and we passed each other. They were recording their first record for Columbia. A couple of those guys remembered me from that night and said, whoa, you want to jam? And, you know, it was Carlos and Greg and everybody. And so we played. And, and Carlos and Greg took me in another room afterwards. And they said, do you want to be in the band? And I said, you know, let me check my schedule. <laughs> They literally followed me home to my parents' house, oh. waited outside while I woke up my folks and said, I'm moving back to the city. You know, they're like rolled over, it's like, whatever. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, but again, I left and drove up with them to the mission, well, to Bernal Heights, and that's how I met Carlos, that night. All right, Jake. I think uh, more questions from the audience. Yeah. Okay. Anybody have a question? Uh, Sorry. What made you start uh, taking up the drums? What was your inspiration? What made me start? Okay. So, Coltrane. No. Eighth grade. I got kicked out of St. Pius. I'm going to Goodwin, and I don't know what I was doing in the classroom. Either I was banging on the desk or making jokes. The teacher said, would you please leave? Go down to the principal's office. I went down to the principal's office, and he you know, did what he did. And I said, OK. And so I'm walking back to the room, and I pass the band room. and. At the door was the percussion section of the band room. And um, it just took me away. I got in trouble all over again. Like, where the hell were you, you know? <laughs> and that day, I went down and bought some drumsticks and three carpet samples. And that's how I started. Yeah, wow. we have another question over here. Well. I have a question for Greg, but it's potentially for both. But first, let me just say that coming a generation later from you guys playing music, you're two of my hero, iconic heroes in the game. So salute. Thank you. Yeah, let's clap it up. So uh, sing a simple song on that drum break. That's one of the like biggest hip hop sample drums currently. And I just want to know why did they record it only on one side? Why was the drums panned to one side? Well, that's just how they used to make, mix records back then. Like all the Beatles stuff, the drums are on one side, vocals on another side, our early stuff. Uh, remixes into the future, they did it differently, but those right. early, all the mid-60s. That's records, just how it was done. They, that's how they did it. Yeah, it interesting. just the style then, you know. And then I think, you know, the next couple of records were mixed a little bit different, but, uh, and you'll find different mixes of it, like say, like remakes where they remastered it and you got a different mix. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and salute you guys. You guys, in my heart, Icons, icons, and I thank you. I'm, I'm thank honored you. to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have another question over here. So my question is, are you still um, in communication with Carlos, or are you still working with him? Um, we're not so much in communication. Um, to be perfectly honest, the reunion thing of Santana 4 was a, a disappointment. I mean, it just seemed completely the natural thing for us to finish that record and tour the world. You know, people were waiting for it. And even some of the gigs, like the big gigs, like the AT&T Park and the Forum in LA, both with Journey, but also with, you know, Steve Miller and, and um, Tower of Power. And we, sh we were 
we were supposed to be on those shows, and the record was advertised on the posters for those shows. People in Europe were expecting us to be on that tour that Santana did. And it's ridiculous for me to hide my disappointment in that. You know, I just, I just like, it took so many years for us to get together and make a record. We did three shows on the East Coast, Madison Square Garden and a couple others, double bill with Journey. They were great. They sold out. And it's like, I didn't appreciate the way they handled the money. And I didn't appreciate um, the fact that there was no communication that we, why we're not going. It was just like blank, you know? And I respect Carlos as much as I respect anybody in the world. I respect his wife as well, who's a great drummer. And I get it, like they, he, he didn't need us. And his manager, I think, wasn't like a fan of us getting back together. It's like, we got a good thing going. Why bring all these guys in? And they all have an opinion. Who wants that, you know? So you get in the studio, and it used to be a band, a real band. Um, you know, where everybody pitched in and made the decisions, which made the music what it was. But I didn't speak to Carlos for two years after those shows, which shows where it went. Prior to that, he and I were best friends. But I also, Carlos is hard to work with as a drummer. It's unbelievable. It really is, I mean. What do you mean? Um, okay, years ago in the 80s, there was a, Carlos had a drummer named Graham Lear, and you know, Graham and I were good friends, and, yeah. and you know, I get curious, like I'm saying like, so what do you get paid, you know? And he says, 3,500 bucks a week and all the abuse you can take, <laughs> you know? Carlos has a thing about drummers, which Greg and I discussed last night, like, he's married to his drummer. <laughs> How the hell does that work, you know? I, I, I'm not, I would say all this in front of Carlos. So it just took a, tur a turn that seems strange to me and it should have been something that it wasn't and there was no explanation. As a result, I think Carlos and I are better being friends than playing together, which would be perfectly fine with me. Michael, I'm a drummer from the South Bay. First of all, thank you for coming here, man. It's yeah. beautiful. My pleasure. Yeah. Um, My people. I have um, a tribute band, and um, there's a lot of tribute bands here in the Bay Area. And one thing that I want to ask you is, um, how did we do it right to make sure that we are honoring every tribute band that we're doing. There's like Santana tribute bands, Prince, War, all that. Can you share or, or help us or guide us to um, make sure that we are doing it respectively? Well, um, I can bring up, a, for instance, today when I'm going to do a little playing with um, with Zebop and and one of the tunes, yeah, one of the tunes that I'm gonna play is a tune that I'm not even sure I ever played live with Santana. It's called Wahida. It's one of my favorite songs from the catalog, and it's one of my top three Carlos solos. Or you know, well Carlos, you know, in some ways he didn't solo. He created these melodies that to do it to not play it exactly would do an injustice to the tune. It's just the way it, those things are. So I had to study this song in the hotel room to remember what I played. And there's a couple of passages. It, 
sections in it where it goes to 6-8 in, in one part, and it goes to double time on the end. But the beauty of it is that Chapito and Carabello went 6-8, but me and the bass stayed in four on the cymbal, and so it made for this, what I realized today when I, I heard, I listened to the band doing it on YouTube, and I thought, they're not getting the subtlety. They're not getting the subtlety. They're not listening hard enough. It's, it's not enough just to play the notes. And both times, and so we went over the tune today, and they just weren't aware that that's what was happening. You know, I can't blame them because I had a hard time hearing it. The drums were low on all the Santana records. I listen to it now and I go, damn, I can hardly hear myself. <laughs> However, that wasn't the point. The point was that we had a, a weave. And was that weave tight enough to hold water? And does it feel good, you know? They're, just those two little things made, gave the song an elegance, is the word I would use. It, it just... It's beautiful, but without it, it, it's something else. It's not terrible, it's just something else. So I guess the answer to your question is listen hard, you know, because we, we thought out everything. Just like when you listen to Sly, I got a chance to play a couple of those songs with Greg a couple of weeks ago at this festival, and the main thing he said to me is, it's the space, just the space. Sp space between the notes. Space between the notes. And it gives it power, you know, it gives it true power. It's not all about soloing and stuff like that, you know. So I would say, you know, you just gotta pay attention, um, you know, but otherwise, thank you for playing the music. Yeah, we, we have a question for Greg. Hi, this is a question for Greg Arrico. Um, you know, Michael touched on Tanglewood as being one of the peak performances for Santana. I was curious, Greg, what would be, in your opinion, a peak performance for Sly and the Family Stone? Would it be Woodstock? Would it be any other concert or performance that comes to mind? Well, the band, you know, when we played live, we probably never played a set exactly the same. This was great about Sly. We, you know, we rehearsed a lot too. Yeah. And, but when we went and performed, all that went out the window and we were in the moment. If there was a mistake, maybe, sometimes you would, that would be turned into something that everybody was talking about because, wow, what was that? Because we'd do something with it. You don't make mistakes, you know, you just do something with it. As far as great shows, you know, Woodstock, of course, is historic. But there were probably, you know, I can't say that there were many, Isle of Wight, uh, there was many places, Madison Square Garden, and, you know, on and on. Sorry? Yeah, you know, I mean, there, was, there were a lot of... Uh, Remember, and there were some that were, you know, I, I could probably answer easy <laughs> what was not uh, a good show, you know, what was, you know, you didn't enjoy, so on. Uh, then I could answer what was my favorite, because there were many that were powerful, good shows. I remember seeing him play with Antonio, Michael, you this is what the Jake Feinberg show is all about. <laughs> um, by the beach. Um, okay. <laughs> I mean, I remember we, when I first got in the band, we had a rehearsal space like somewhere south of Market, brick and everything. Yeah. Then we had a place on Fillmore. Yeah, I remember. Um, Upper Fillmore for many years. I remember we did a gig out there with the Grateful Dead um, out by the beach. 
Hmm? Family dog gig. And um, Chet Helms, thank you. Chet Helms. Yeah. And, you know, they filmed it and it's out there, but sometimes you just forget that, you know, you go to the gig and you forget that you're playing with the Grateful Dead and by mistake you have some of the punch. And I, as soon as it came on, I'm, I was like, you weren't thinking. Obviously, they would dose everything with LSD if they could, and they did. So that whole gig, it was like, you know, how am I going to drive home, much less play the set, you know? <laughs> did you, did you uh, write lyrics with, I mean, like Sly would just, people would be like, yo, everyday people, and he'd write it down on the, on the back of a matchbook. And then the rhythm section would come in and create, but ultimately Sly would come in with lyrics. But did, I know Coster did a lot of writing with Ndugu, but did you write with Santana? I did some writing, yeah. Like, is there any one semi like thing that you are really? Pr I know you you were a Joe Beam fanatic. Yeah, we did Stone Stoneflower, that was called. Um, but some of the other stuff, um, like um, the one with Flora, Yours Is the Light, that one. I wrote lyrics. There were a number of them that I wrote lyrics that... Um, How did you guys work together with that? I mean, would you just have a, a... I would just go write lyrics, you know, and hope they like them. And, and also, another thing with Santana, which is kind of curious, is that our rehearsals were all about the music. We never, ever rehearsed any vocals. So it wasn't about that, you know? So Greg's just singing. And, you know, if it's Oyo Como Va, you know, everybody sings it. But, um, and so I guess I kind of saw an opium, opening. I saw the opium and I um, <laughs> took it. Oh, no, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, um, I saw an opening and, and I like to write lyrics. I've always been a fan of songs from Burt Bacharach to anybody, you know, and studied those records as well. And so I enjoyed it. And nobody else was doing it, you know. So, I would do it. Okay, we have another question up here for both of them. What is the most benevolent stuff you, you've been able to do with your wealth and fame? Oh boy, oh boy. <laughs> well, that village in Africa that I, you know, I don't know, I try to be a good guy. You know, I, I, I haven't started a foundation or anything like that. Um, okay, in, in Seattle, I started a thing called More Music at the Moor, it's a theater, that brought in young musicians of high school age from all different various um, ethnic groups. And we created a show that now is going on into its 15th year. I directed it for five years and started it. But now people like Sheila E., Robert Glasper come every year and, and lead the kids. And that's a good thing I did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Knowing, How about you? Knowing what you know now. <laughs> good. Yeah. All right. Good. Yeah. Knowing what you know now. What would you do differently at Woodstock? <laughs> really? <laughs> okay, I'll tell you what I would have done. In my drum solo, I would have not stopped the damn groove. Yeah. I would just, you know, it's a groove, it's a groove, it's a groove, and then what does Shreve do? He stops the groove and gets, like, sensitive. <laughs> Whenever, I have a hard time watching it because, honestly, I go, again, what the hell were you thinking? There's 500,000 people there, don't stop the groove. And so I would have, in retrospect, I would have just kept playing and done the groove, but, but who am I to say? Because people seem to like it. You know? Whatever it was, yeah, they it dug was, it, man, you know? they dug it. <laughs> yeah. All right, Jake, Jake, we have another question over here. Uh, yeah, I used to hear Bill Grant tell stories. Uh, he was a big dancer at the Palladium before he came west. But he told a story about he got a little frustrated with these uh, big rock bands 
It was like this. I'm sorry, who are we talking about? Bill, Bill Graham. Bill, okay. Yeah, so he got a lot of little frustrated with these big rock bands that would have this obligatory drum solo. Yeah. That would go on and on in the middle of the act. Yeah. And so I, I, I'm with him. Yeah, so he booked Buddy Rich at the Fillmore to uh-huh. open up for 10 years after yeah. to kind of like show the drummer of 10 years after yeah. how it was done. I was wondering if either you guys were at that show or knew about that or you know, that situation. I wasn't at the show, but I was a huge Buddy Rich fan. And um, another show that my brother Kevin and I went to at the Sheraton Hotel in Palo Alto, um, like when we were 16 and Buddy Rich was playing. And, and he came out the door and I introduced myself. I studied out of his book and stuff like that. And also in the big band in San Mateo College, we played some of the Buddy Rich, like when the West Side Story stuff came out. Um, I was blown away. Um, but he came out and he invited us in. Like he took us down. Do you remember that? Some you don't remember finally. Okay. Down in the front row, got us seats. And what I remember after being blown away was he stood up afterwards and he was in such intense pain in his back. He had to like kind of crawl against the wall in the back just to walk. But he played his ass off. Um, that's a great, that was a great move on Bill Graham's part. I, after a while, I really, like, I don't like playing Soul Sacrifice now so much, you know, because it's like, I, I don't know, the solo, you know. The, it's magic moments, and, you know, you, you don't try to recreate them all the time, you know, because, anyway. What was your question? <laughs> Greg, any final words? Say again? Any final words from you? Uh, I'm happy to see you all come out and have us talk about this history yeah, that touches so upon everybody. It's great, yeah. you know? I wa- yeah, I want to thank the both of you for coming out and, you know, uh, letting us relive some of this. And here is some of the inside. And, uh, I don't know if you remember Voices of Latin Rock. We brought the band together, like in uh, I think it was 2008. Yeah, yeah, I you know? remember. Sure. So, so we were. Thank you, Bernie. For the first ones for doing that. Thank, thank you, yeah. Dr. Uh, so, uh, thank you guys again. And uh, if you guys uh, check on uh, Latin Rock Inc. Facebook or the website, we will let you know uh, about the documentary and when it comes out. But well, thank listen, you I mean, guys again. I mean, Michael Shreve's about to play some music, about to play some drums, so don't go anywhere, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we got a surprise for you. Right. So we're going to take a short break, set Shreve, the stage. Shreve, Rico, thank and you. And we'll be right back. Bye, y'all. <laughs>